This is episode five of our Five Themes of Geography video series. And this one is all about movement, which asks the question, how and why are places connected? So there are three things we take into consideration when we're talking about movement. First is where is something starting? This could be some sort of good or product or something that's going to be sent through the mail or by Amazon or FedEx or UPS or whatever. It could also be information. It could be news. In this case, let's say the where is Tokyo. And let's say the product is uh, a pair of socks. The next thing we have to figure out is where is it going? So where are our socks from Tokyo going to be sent? And let's say San Francisco. So clearly, we're answering the question of how is it going to get there. It's going to have to be either by a cargo ship or airplane because of the distance that it's got to cover and the fact that there's an ocean between them. And that's basically anything you're sending back and forth, you take that into consideration, whether it's 2016 or 1,000 or two or 3,000 years ago. Moving goods and information from one place to another is probably the easiest way to describe what movement is all about. So we have here is a map that shows trade routes from a long, long time ago. The red lines are things that uh, are routes that are being used 200 BC, so that's about 2,200 years ago, 2,200 years ago. The blue lines are routes that they started using about 1,300 years ago, and the yellow ones are the most recent ones. They're the new ones. They were only being used 1,200 years ago, and you can see some of the goods that they were trading. You had cloth and clothing. You had incense, which was used to uh, make things not smell quite so bad. You had ivory, which was used for a number of things, uh, metals and stones. Silks were really, really important for making clothes and things like that. And then spices and timber, which were all very valuable things. I think we think of spices now as something that, you know, you just go to Wegmans or Giant or wherever you want to go and pick them up very easily. But back then, they were kind of hard to come by. So you can see where the trade routes, routes were. And given when this was, there was really basically two or three different ways you could send things. One was by sailing ships or ships that would be powered by people rowing. Uh, the other was to go across land either by some sort of cart being pulled by an animal or somebody walking. And if you look at how big this area of this map is, you're talking about walking from China all the way to Italy, which is not a short walk. So this is how things moved 2,000 years ago, and it was, as you probably guess, extremely slow. Things got a little faster as time went on. We eventually developed what's called a canal system. This is the Erie Canal in New York, which was boat traffic that went over land. They actually dug basically a, a man-made river and put boats in there. You see the boats are actually being pulled by those horses, and it actually made shipping goods much, much quicker back in the 1800s. That gave way eventually to the steamship, which meant you didn't need wind, although there is a sail on that one. You didn't need somebody rowing. You had a, an actual engine that would produce steam, and that was going to power your boats through rivers and through lakes and over the ocean. That eventually gave way to the railroad, and I love this poster because of the angry, kind of crazed look on the face of the train. People were scared of trains when they first uh, were, were being built. This whole poster is actually warning people in Philadelphia that they were going to be building a train going through Philadelphia and telling people how awful it was going to be. That You can see there's the train is just going down the street. The guy's got to get out of the way of it. You're going to get hit by it. People are complaining about it. Um, it ended up being okay. But what uh, trains did was actually was a much quicker mode of transportation going over the land. It was faster than people walking. It was faster than people or riding carts and being pulled by animals. You could take goods. You can take people back and forth. And eventually, about probably about 35 years after this poster was made, the whole country was connected to what we call the Transcontinental Railroad, which actually connected California to the eastern part of the country. So railroads became part of movement. And then eventually, sometime after the Wright brothers, handsome fellows like this who had been flying planes back and forth, for the most part, planes started out as just something kind of cool to do, like, hey, I can fly, isn't that great? And then eventually, we started making bigger planes that were not going to crash all the time, and then we could start taking goods and people and that sort of thing uh, from one place to another. It wasn't until the 1920s that uh, somebody actually flew across the ocean. That was a guy named Charles Lindbergh who flew from 
um, from the United States to France. But now, of course, we have jumbo jets and all sorts of stuff like that. Our modern transportation is pretty much the same. It's just more technologically advanced. We have cargo ships like this, which can take millions of pounds of goods all around the world. I mean, they're humongous ships. We have planes like FedEx that could take things back and forth. and Generally, not your gigantic, huge uh, goods, but they can definitely send things back and forth globally. But most of our goods are actually still shipped by trucks to the United States using our highway system. So the next thing that movement actually asks is why are people moving? So people move, obviously. Um, you know, we see people move for jobs. If they get a job offer in a different city, they'll transfer to that city. Um, people move all across the country. Sometimes it's for economic reasons. Sometimes it's because of the fact that there are no jobs where they are. So back in the 1930s, there was something that happened that was called the Dust Bowl. And it was a really uh, dry period. There was no rain. And what happened was a lot of farmlands dried up and windstorms came through and just blew dust all over the place and buried entire towns in dust. And it kind of looked like this. And that's a car that's got dust all over it. So people realized that they couldn't survive in this area. So what they decided to do is they decided to pile into cars and, and try to move to places where they would have actually had jobs. So this took place mostly in like Oklahoma and Texas in the center of the country. And a lot of those folks actually tried to get to California. Some piled into their cars and took their entire families and whatever they could stick onto their cars. And some had to walk. So movement in this case would ask the question, why were these people moving? And the answer to that question is because they lost their lands, they lost their homes, their homes were destroyed. They were lucky just to survive, and now they had to move someplace to get jobs. So that's another aspect of movement. Just to kind of tie this in with uh, human environment interaction, a lot of them got to California and realized that there weren't many jobs out there either, because this is right in the middle of the Great Depression. So they ended up living in basically towns that were made of tents. So we talked about shelter in the last episode. This was the shelter that a lot of them had to live in once they got to California. And the last part of movement that we'll talk about is the moving of information. Um, this contraption here doesn't look like much, but this might be the most important invention in human history. This is actually a printing press. And what this did was it allowed people to print writings and the news and books and all sorts of stuff very, very quickly because before that, books were actually made by people sitting down and handwriting copies of books, which, as you can imagine, was extraordinarily slow. So this printing press actually allowed it to happen much, much quicker. If you look very closely, the date on there is 1702. The printing press is actually goes back to about 1440, so you're talking about 600 years ago. And it made it so you could share information much, much quicker. You still had the problem, though, of how to get that information out to people because you're still moving things by either cart or boat or somebody walking. So there's a period of time in American history where we see something called the Pony Express, which you may have heard of. And this actually was a service that took letters from Missouri to California, and they're advertising that they could actually do it in 10 days or less, which now I could send an email from St. Joseph, Missouri to California in a tenth of a second. Then it was going to take about a week and a half. Um, the people who did this job, they rode very, very quickly. They had to be young and skinny, so that's why they reined the horses down so the horses could run faster. And they got paid $25 a week, which at that time was actually a lot of money. And as we had mentioned, and I talked about a little bit, all of these different things that we just talked about as far as sharing information, including music, which one way, the only way really to share music hundreds of years ago was either to listen to somebody play you music or to buy sheet music like this and then play it if you could play an instrument. Eventually... Thomas Edison invents something called the phonograph, and these are his drawings of what the phonograph is going to look like. It eventually turned into something like this, which we call a record player. And now musicians could record their music onto a record, 
Uh, people could record speeches onto the records, and people could buy those records, put them on their record player, and listen to them. And now you can actually send music back and forth. You could send music across the globe. You could hear music without having to buy sheet music and play it yourself or listen to somebody sitting right in front of you. And, of course, all of this is now done by a smartphone. I can send messages to this in seconds. I can download music out of this and listen to anything from Bach and Beethoven all the way up to whatever recording artist is doing stuff now, whether it's Adele or whoever else. So all of those are actually examples of movement. It's not just, you know, getting in a car and moving back and forth or a truck or a bus or a plane or a train or whatever else. And it's not just sending letters and all that. It's 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 sending information and people and goods in the different ways we do that. And of course, that changes over time. The smartphone has replaced a lot of them in a lot of ways. So that's the end of the movement video. And the next episode is unfortunately our last, and that's episode six. And that'll be all about regions, which is a pretty important one. We'll see you then.